First, Mo, um, before you came out, you introduced the film, and you said funny shit can be serious, and serious shit can be funny, and we had a lot of laughs in here over a lot of uh, heavy stuff. How did you do it? Um, explain that quote, and then tell us what made you think about this film when thinking about that quote. That's a great question. Thank you, and thank you all again for being here on this windy Wednesday in L.A. This is amazing, it's beautiful. I'm just taking it in. Y'all gonna have to forgive me for just taking it in. Take I don't time. take anything for granted. My beautiful cast and supporters up here. Um, in terms of the question, I wanted to make a film that touched on and was able to articulate a lot of private conversations I had in my mind with people close to me and things that were happening in the world. But I didn't want to be fucking boring. Mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be didactic. I didn't want it to be uh, one-dimensional. So in thinking about that and thinking about my own life, how oftentimes really bad things happen, and then when I think back and reflect, it was kind of absurd and wasn't that big of a deal. It was crazy. And like, it's all absurd. A lot of it is really crazy. So I felt like this story, in order to touch on these topics, to do it in a way that could hopefully be fresh and unique for an audience, bringing levity and introducing that absurdity will give us an opportunity to maybe pick up some things that are thought-provoking, but also have a good time in the process. Cool. Um, who did you have in mind um, when you created this film? Like, who would be your perfect audience member for, 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 as an audience? Who would be your perfect audience member? Everybody that's here tonight. <laughs> Give it up. No, seriously, it's the people that show up on a Wednesday to see a film like this. It's the people that like to think. It's the people that like to feel. It's the people that appreciate art, mm -hmm. that are OK with questioning. And Woo! Thank you. Oh, they're like, Mo really is up there. I know, right? <laughs> no, but it's really everybody that's like appreciative of art and people pushing boundaries and having uncomfortable conversations. That's the audience. Okay, um, I'll punch out to the cast as I go uh, down here. Um, how did each of you get involved in the film other than an audition? Uh, and, and why was it important for you to be involved into this? Uh, and I'll start with you. Yeah, Mo, um, Mo been my man for a little minute. We did a movie together. And um, I, I could just tell just from that experience that it was somebody I always wanted. I, that I, it was it was somebody that I wanted to be around. Um, mm -hmm. So when he told me about the audition, it really was a no brainer. And then it just helps that the script that he wrote was just absolutely incredible. Um, and then the audition, yeah, that was that's kind of how I got into it. Cool, uh, Lex. Well, I was around for when it was a short film and watched him go through that process, and uh, also was an advocate for him to create the feature and I mean it, we're we're married and right. um, <laughs> that's give what it up you call for my support, muse. right? So give it up for my muse. <laughs> um but it, it was it's very personal for me to be a part of it. I'm lucky enough to be a part of it. Um I actually sat back and, and didn't expect to even get the chance and the opportunity to be in it. I was just kind of just, just championing him to write it and to, to take a risk and to just just let life go a little bit and support whatever we needed to do for him to get the pages done. And we did a table read at our house and, and on our dining room table and invited some friends. And it just, it came to life before our eyes. And so to be able, again, lucky enough to play Candy, it's an understatement for me, really. It's, it's personal. I just want to see him win, really. Cool. He wins, you win too, right? I said, when he wins, you win as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's all right. Shamir. Mine's not that romantic, by the way. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> OK, it is. I love you remember Mo when too. we first met? <laughs> um, yeah, I met Mo many moons ago, actually, on my first American project. I'm Canadian. And uh, we got to act opposite each other. 
And fast forward a few years later, I get this email saying that Moma Cray is directing. You know, Hollywood's about who you know. I'm like, I'm gonna get a straight offer. I know Moma Cray. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna walk through and get this job. No, I had to audition. <laughs> and so I auditioned back home in Toronto, and you know, I made this wacky, weird self tape. Anyone who knows me, I really pushed the envelope, and you know, thankfully Mo saw the art in there and made me work for it. And, uh, and I showed up willingly and happily and just being able to do the, the work. And you know, Mo called me in the car. I was driving behind a Toronto streetcar saying I was this guy. And he wanted to do this with me and work opposite some incredible artist. And um, you know, starring in this film alongside these folks has been incredible. You know, I look up to all of them. You know, I'm a fan first. And uh, I was just you know, ecstatic to be able to be a part of this Avenger team of folks. So that's it, I'm just the Canadian in this film. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. And to the EPs, uh, David, um, when you guys, and any, right? Any. When you guys took a look at this project, um, what made you want to champion it and jump on it? Uh, well, for me personally, uh, similarly, I've known Mo for a long time. We uh, did a film called The Butler together, and we became... Um, <laughs> thank you. Woo! Um, we, we became uh, fast friends, and um, I, I remember say, saying to Mo, I, we were doing a scene together, and you know, every, time, every now and again you work with someone, and you go, whoa, that's, that is genuine talent. Um, and it was a force. It is a force with him. And, and so when we started talking and he uh, talked about directing and then showed me this short, there's a short version of this film that was all in one take. I mean, how many minutes was it? It was, a it was like 16, 17. 16 minute one take, you know, and it was just a mind-blowingly well-executed short film. And, um, you know, I've been a beneficiary of advocacy. You know, I, I think as an artist, as an actor, you don't really know how good you are unless people tell you. Um, and that's unfortunate, um, but it's, it's the reality. And I, say, I only say unfortunate because you, you're, you are reliant on those people, and if they don't exist, then you, sometimes that talent can die on the vine. And I've been someone who's been a beneficiary of people advocating for me. So in a friend, in someone I deeply love and someone who I truly think is talented, my thing was I just want Mo to be known for the artist that he is. And so, you know, I just came on to be able to do anything and everything I could to, to see him fly. Cool. Thank you. So, <laughs> here we are. Mo is uh, more like a brother than he is a friend. Uh, we've had some really incredible moments along the way. This film, as people spoke about, started as a short. And I've seen a few shorts that Mo directed prior to that. And Mo is a serious cat. <laughs> like when he sets his sights on something, he's not playing around. He talks about being from South Central Stakes are high, and he was not playing around with his approach to this film. So he asked me to produce the short. I said, of course. He asked me to produce the film. I said, of course. And then we set out on this life-changing journey. Mo talked about being emotional earlier. If we share what we went through on this film, being shut down halfway through, uh, by COVID, in the middle of the shoot, COVID is happening. The world is changing. Some of the subject matters in this film are uh, reflect what was happening in the world. Mm -hmm. The financing fell out of the movie two days before we started shooting. We then rallied together solved that problem, and I'm glossing over quite a bit of really personal things Spike talked about putting up his own money for his first film. All of that happened. Mo took out all of the money in his bank account until we got the rest of the money. 
And so there were moments where we literally had to hold each other up during this process, physically. Two black men shooting a film about pretty unconventional uh, themes. Thank you. And, and the process of making a film is like going into battle. You kiss your family, you tell them I'll see you in like three months. <laughs> 17 and, days in our case. Yeah, and, and then you go to work. Right. And it is all encompassing. These beautiful actors, which this process was very much like a play. I mean, we sent the actors through multiple auditions with multiple chemistry reads, and Shamir was very, uh, you know, humble in talking about his self-tape. It's the best self-tape I've ever seen. And Ilan and Cleo, the the, the one yeah, give it up for Cleopatra yeah. Coleman Cleo. who plays Vanessa. Like, the the oneer you guys saw at the beginning of the film, which was adopted from the short, was like 11, 12 minutes in the feature. Longer. It literally brought us to tears when we got that tape that you saw. We had auditioned it so many times, went through it, and it is the, the film that is written, the film that is shot, and the film that is edited, but the, on the day, watching these beautiful actors execute the script and bring their spirits was a lot. That being said, I, I would just give a nod to you for anybody to pull together. A lot of filmmakers in the room, anyone in here knows putting a film together from the beginning, actually writing it and seeing it through to the end when you lose financing and things like that, but being able to stick it through with friends and put up your own money for it um, deserves um, accolades. So thank you for a wonderful job. job, all of you. Um, when the film opened, um, it was crazy looking at this husband and wife who had tons of means, it looks like, um, and uh, I believe his name is James, right? And uh, he has this wonderful job where he's an attorney and he's making all kinds of money. Um, and he's working with all of these white men who's looking at him as, you know, this young black man is coming in here and he's making money for us. And of course he wants to protect that job. And so when he's at home in his blue silk robe and he's laid up and they turn on the news and it's a police shooting. Uh, police brutality once again, and it's a repeated thing. And you have two people in a household who sees things a little bit differently. And he wants to also keep the peace in his house. Um, it dinged to me that this thing is all about conversations and conflict. And not necessarily about, it's centered around police brutality, but it's about having conversations or difficult conversations with people um, that sometimes don't see eye to eye. What made you hone in on the conversations? Because everybody in the film seems to see something a little bit different when they could be looking at the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a uh, really astute assessment. That's very much what the driving force was, just the conversations, the conversations I was having, the conversations in the news, on Twitter, and all these different Facebook arguments, and all these different things we have. We all look at the same moment, and mm -hmm. it's like a prism. And we all see something different while looking at the same thing. So I just feel like that was a great opportunity to have a very objective look into those varying points of views and realize that everybody's a little bit wrong most of the time and nobody's all the way right. right. And that the things that we're all focused on kind of close to the title ends up being a lot of nothing. All these divisive things that we focus on ends up amounting to a lot of nothing. So this, so I'll ask this of the actors and any one of you can take this. Um, as you prepared as an actor for the character you were um, choosing to live in, did you, um, did you have to make certain choices as an actor where you had to set your own personal feelings aside as a person to say, okay, I know I would never do this, but I actually have to live in this? Or is, are there some things that you would disagree with with your character? 
<laughs> well, um, yeah, there's always going to be that. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be that. I think that's the, the great adventure about acting is sort of you have to be somebody that's completely compassionate to what your character goes through. Right. And with James, yeah, there was a, a lot of things that I, I would do, do completely differently. I think um, the big thing for him is he's just so afraid of everything. I mean, he has this public persona that just persists in everything that he does. You know, he has a persona when it comes to his relationship with his brother. He has a persona when it comes to work. He has a pers everything that he does is always, um, you know, th there's no, it, 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 he's, fe he's fearful. You know, he's looking for safety. So that's something I related to um, and I, that I was able to find sort of like a, you know, that complemented what I was working with, but yeah. Um, Shamir? When you think about uh, your character you played, um, are you naturally a jokester like that or always find the funny in the randomest situations? There, sometimes you just gave a simple look and everybody just like fell out laughing. I thought it was, it was amazing, amazing job. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I'm very serious in my everyday life to be honest though. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it Why again. are you laughing? <laughs> Uh, no, I just think my main thing when approaching a role is, you know, funny is money, charming is disarming, you know, and the aesthetics of Jamal, you know, when he walks into his space, a lot of things come to mind. And so I wanted to do my best to juxtapose that where we hear that black men are very aggressive. And I say that's passion, right? And Jamal is passionate about his cause. And you know, with passion comes joy. And I think there's joy in Jamal and why you know, there's levity in those things. And kudos to my filmmaker, the captain of the ship, who allowed me to you know, play within the margins and finding those pops. You know, the subject mar matter, you know, they're talking about some, some deep stuff. You know, we're laughing and whatnot, but a kid died, someone's kidnapped, and they're about to go to jail if you know, somebody catches, you know, catches them. So it's important for me to, to be able to, you know, in the work, you know, try to find the levity and all of that, but still keeping it grounded. Um, you never play the funny, right? It's just the circumstance. So every time y'all are laughing, I, Jamal was serious. But, you know, y'all found that, you know, people found that interesting and funny. I think that's the beauty about all the performances here is that, you know, even Jamal, you know, is who, you know, Jamal and, and, and um, you know, Alon and, and, and you know, what he's doing is, is hilarious across the board, but he's, you know, has conviction and he's decisive, you know, and he has his North Star and he wants to chase it, you know, but, um, but yeah, you know, it comes from the page. I told this to Mo and, you know, he wrote it, you know, and all we mm -hmm. did as actors is just added our sauce. So, yeah. Cool. Lex, um, you were able to highlight something when it comes to food, being a vegan. Um, I thought it was interesting because that made it made the movie not just about police brutality, but a lot of conversations we have and get into arguments about um, something simple as food. And she's like, "Well, it's a free range chicken." <laughs> <laughs> and I think you, you wrote, um, "Well, it's not free if it's, I guess, born, born to, be, to slaughtered. be slaughtered or something like that." I was like, "Man, that was." That was cold. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> talk about your character, um, because I found her really interesting um, and engaging, um, but the most laid back and grounded, it seemed to me, as well. Thank you for that. Um, it, she's, she's so relatable, uh, Candy. And I feel like they're on the page. I remember the first time we did a table read of it. On the page, you could easily read all of those things as tropes, mm -hmm. um, something that comes with Hollywood or, you know. Um, and Mo pushed for it to be grounded and pushed for it to remind us of that, that around the way girl that we all know, um, who is just a, a little bit, she's, she believes she's elevated in her mindset, you know, she's above certain things of her community. Um, but not to put anyone down, but just to enlighten our our communities, really. Mm -hmm. And um, I think 
it, it's just a lot of it's relatable because I when I met Mo, I also was a vegan, and so it was like a certain. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff in there that is is very uh, similar to myself. At the same time, um, just in general for me, and I think strategically, strategically, so um, into the writing, there's something in all of us in each of these characters that is extremely relatable, even Officer Brian, and a huge part of going into making something that's seemingly tropey feel grounded is because we all are stretching to find ourselves in all of these voices. And Mo's writing is exceptional to be able to break down the psyche of so many minds of different Americans. Every voice in this room, every mind in this room, something up there was said that you were probably thinking. And something up there was said that probably made you uncomfortable. But the point of it was us to figure out why. Yes. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> you um, mentioned something. It was, it was at the top of the show when they had learned of uh, the police shooting the young child and they were trying to figure out what to do. And they built it up and it was like, let's make a post. <laughs> um, how many of you made posts before? How many, how many? Um, Are we not keeping it real in here? I oh, see. I thought this was a real space. Um, talk about that. In this age of like social media, a lot of times people may get out and march. Somebody else may donate. Um, and somebody might sit at home <laughs> and write a post. And sometimes that can seem really ineffective. Um, tell us your thoughts about it and why that was so specific. So quickly, the thought process on that for me, and kind of like one of the things that actually ends up being like the bastion of the whole film is that we all want to do something, but what can we actually do mm -hmm. ends up being the thought. So the thing that we have access to, I've heard this phrase I thought was great, like armchair activism. And you in your chair, you're at home, you fire it up, you're arguing with your auntie who's voting for the wrong person on Facebook, and all that stuff is happening. So I was like, that's what we all do. That's what we relate to. And then I was like, okay, now what happens if we take it one step further and actually do something with the problem being next door? Mm -hmm. So the first thing was like, okay, let's do what we always do, which is social media. And then the question, the thesis statement is, what happens if we do the next thing and then discover we're actually ill-equipped to do anything else. And then that felt like, for me, a great opportunity for the dramatic tension, the comedy of errors, and this whole exploration and this journey, because it's like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but what if we did that? Well, now we see what happens. Right. <laughs> it's, uh, I guess you end up going to the absurd. Um, yeah. You kidnap somebody and bring them into your house and there's all kind of errors made. Um, after the entire process, uh, seeing what's went on in the world, it, I think it, I find it interesting that you all made this movie in the height of the pandemic, uh, given the uh, access to George Floyd and everything else that happened in 2020 and before and still going on and afterwards. Um, what now, after this film? What do you want people to take away from it? I, I'm so happy you asked me that because every time someone asks me what I want people to take away, depending on where I am in my life or in that day, I feel like it's something different. But the one consistent is I want people to leave this film and give themselves permission to feel whatever they felt and be okay with that. I feel like we're in a time where we're not feeling like we're giving the opportunity to be truthful to how we feel in terms of what we need, what hurts us, what makes us laugh, what makes us cry. So I wanted to create something where you have those moments like the Facebook post and a lot of people laugh and some people lean forward like, oh yeah, I hope they write a good fucking post. <laughs> And that's okay, both of those things are okay. And hopefully in that thought of being able to feel whatever you feel and be comfortable with that, then you can have an honest conversation with yourself, and then an honest conversation with the other people in this world that we inhabit. Because right now all the conversations feel fake. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and it's not real. So I think it's up to the artists, like these wonderful people here that lent their, their, and this is where it hit me, because, ah, it, it's just, I, I'm speaking about this film, and it oftentimes it feels unfair for me to answer and talk about it so much because it only exists because of these people and so many other people, whether it was the money falling out, the people uh, giving notes on the script, the PAs, mm -hmm. the grips. We were making this movie. I have my camera. I see Aaron Gant here. Aaron Gant, raise your hand, bro. So Big Aaron. Aaron Gant operated the camera for that Warner in the beginning. That's, that's, we did that, you know, it's 20 minutes. I don't know, we shot on an Aerie Alexa. That's a big ass camera. And we did multiple takes after take after take. And when we got shut down, I never forget all the tearful phone calls. And I've been in this industry for 20 years. And on this movie, I saw, like, I never seen a grip cry in my whole life. <laughs> I saw Grips cry, I just saw so many people give so much, and there's something about that process of, of whether people like the movie or not, I hope there's a, 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 that the real emotion and heart and care that went into it is palpable. Whether you agree with the choices or not, this was truly a labor of love and a pure attempt at art and an offering into the world that could hopefully do something on some level, even if it's only make you have one thought, one feeling, then we won with this film. Cool, and a wonderful job, by the way. Give it up. <laughs> what would you say to other filmmakers or even to other actors, uh, other producers, and anybody can answer this question, who find themselves in that position to where the finances just fell out of the bottom. Um, we lost someone for whatever reason. Um, what do you say to someone to help them keep going? Keep going? <laughs> that's it, honest to God, that's it. Like, I, I remember I had a very poignant moment with a friend of mine who was incredibly successful. I was in his backyard, palatial home. I was having a rough time in my life, and I was like, man, shit is hard, this went wrong, this went bad. And he's like, yeah, I've been through stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> and so for all you filmmakers, now there's a bunch of talented people out there, anybody else chime in, but it's going to be hard, it's supposed to be hard, you have to accept that. Like Jordan is who he is because of what he did with the flu. The flu game, when I think about Jordan, is what makes him special. So you gotta embrace the adversity and keep on playing. Okay. Let, let me let me add to that moment, Craig. Go for it, Andy Clemens. Well, you said something at the beginning. You said you came from a place where people just kept telling you what you can't do, what you shouldn't do. And a lot of us in this path, like there's no roadmap to becoming a producer or, you know, especially if you come from where we come from. And so, Mo's like, do you want to produce this movie with me? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> like, let's go do it. But there's no real nurturing system that gives you the tools to go out and say, you can do that. So it really is this connection that you have with your tribe in this town. And a lot of people in this room are a part of that tribe from wives to daughters to friends, they give you that you know, audacity to fucking do it. Mm -hmm. Mo was talking about his cameraman. In this film, when Candy is giving birth, I cry almost every time. It is so beautifully shot and directed, and Mo is on the camera in that scene with his wife delivering this baby. And it was real moments happening. These actors had to stop what they were doing in the middle of the movie and just sit in the character for 10 months and come back even more, like the world had changed. 
even more dedicated to the character, even more in pocket before we shut down. And so when you see the commitment of artists, it keeps you going. When I see friends out there on screen killing it, it keeps me going. When I see David doing his thing around the world in multiple things, in all kinds of arenas, it keeps me going. Shamir is all over the place, <laughs> doing everything. John Wick 4 coming up. At a high level. <laughs> it keeps you going. And so the victory is sitting here accomplishing something that many people said we couldn't do. Amen. You guys are going to kill a cop at the end? <laughs> the white cop? <laughs> Audiences are conditioned to see black people die in a film. So we had people step to us and say, yo, it's great, but I think you might have to change the ending. <laughs> Why? Well, it just makes people feel uncomfortable. Exactly. Give it up for them, y'all. And it looks like we're getting the wind it up sign. So I'll say this, uh, wonderful film. Uh, enjoyed watching it. And the one thing I'll take away, and I hope everyone in here takes away, it'll be one of Candy's lines. Um, and it said, an open dialogue requires an open mind. Yeah, Let yeah, talk. yeah. Um, give it up. Thank y'all, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.